case, and that's the uh, first part of this chapter. And I suppose I could have named or titled the reflection, words count, they mean something. But I was more struck by uh, a particular phrase, so I chose to title this reflection, Becoming Poetry Written. So that's what kind of caught my brain, and we can reflect on that as we go down. Um, earlier this week, I watched a movie, Three Billboards Outside Ebbing, Missouri. Anyone see that movie when it was showing at the picture? Okay, Liz. Uh, this film had seven nominations at the Academy Awards. It won Best Actress and Best Supporting Actor. Now, at the Globe Awards, it won also Best Picture, Best Actor, Best Supporting Actor, and Best Screenplay. In short, it was considered a very good film. <coughs> now, I'm going to give you the short version of this because I kind of anticipated that not most of you would have seen it while it was out. Um, but the story goes something like this. In the town of Ebbing, Missouri, Mildred Hayes is grieving the rape and murder of her teenage daughter, Angela, seven months earlier. Angry over the lack of progress in the investigation, Mildred rents three abandoned billboards near her house and posts on them, on one billboard, rape while dying, second billboard, still no arrests, and the third, how come, Chief Willoughby? The billboards upset the townspeople, including Sheriff Willoughby. The billboards upset uh, not only the, the townspeople, but also the chief and the racist, violent, alcoholic officer, Jason Dixon, just to name a few. The open secret that Willoughby suffers terminal pancreatitis adds to everyone's disapproval of the way that Mildred was handling her grief. While Willoughby is sympathetic to Mildred's frustration, he finds that the billboards an unfair attack on his character. Angered by Mildred's lack of respect of his authority, Deputy Dixon threatens and at one point brutally assaults businessman Red Willoughby, who rented Mildred the billboards. He also arrests her African-American friend and co-worker, Denise on trivial marijuana possession charges. Mildred is visited also by her abusive ex-cop, ex-husband, Charlie, who blames her for their daughter's death. Mildred is also visited and threatened by a cropped hair stranger at her store, which leads the audience to believe that he might be the murderer of her daughter. Willoughby decides to commit suicide, to spare his family the pain of watching him die of cancer. He leaves suicide notes for several people, including Mildred, in which he explains to her that she was not a factor in his suicide and that he secretly had paid to keep the billboards up for another month. Assume, amused at the trouble that this would bring her and hoped that they would still draw attention to the murder. There was a note left for Dixon, giving him advice to let go of the extreme hate that he was carrying around and learn to love as the only way to realize his wish of becoming a detective. Now, Dixon takes to heart this advice that his mentor gave. And then one evening, while he is at a bar restaurant, overhears the crop-haired man who threatened Mildred, bragging in this bar of having raped and killed a girl in the same manner as Mildred's father. He goes outside, notes the Idaho plates of the man's vehicle, then provokes a fight between this man and himself through scratching the crop-haired man's face. This was a way of giving him a sample of the DNA of the 
a suspected criminal. The DNA sample does not match the DNA found on Angela's body. And that man also happened to be overseas on military duty during that time of Angela's death. Dixon concludes that this man must be guilty of some other rape, and he joins Mildred on a trip to Idaho in order to kill him. On the way, they express uncertainty about their mission, but agree to decide what to do along the way. And that's how the movie ends. You don't know what's going to happen. You don't know what the decision will be, whether they carry out their own justice, or whether they pull back and regroup. What moved me so deeply in this story was the amount of anger and outrage that almost everybody in the story was living with. Mildred, angry over her daughter's murder. The deputy, angry over the lack of respect given by, to him by almost everyone. The townspeople, anger, anger over Mildred's audacity on keeping the police department accountable. Mildred's son being angry at his mother for the way she's handling it because it affects his school. The, the widow was also angry over the illness and the suicide of her husband. Everybody living in that community lived with outrage in one manner or another. Much like the amount of outrage that we are experiencing today throughout our country. No matter what the topic is, we are experiencing outrage at an unprecedented level. Some time ago, there used to be just a topic or two that might outrage us as a nation. But anymore, Almost hourly, we're changing from one focus of outrage to another focus of outrage to another focus of outrage. The problem with expressing outrage is this. It generally comes through destructive behavior. Most of today's outrage isn't in order to fix something, but rather just to express the anger that is feeding on itself. So how do we as Christians live our daily life when confronted with so much outrage? In the movie storyline, an act of evil was repaid by another act of hate. And that hate was repaid back by evil actions, and generally against those innocent of that particular act. To the point that a man's life becomes endangered because he is thought to be a rapist with no real proof, no trial, no due process of justice. But through this suicide note that Sheriff Willoughby passed out to a number of people, there was comfort given to a grieving mother, support to an angry deputy about what life has dished out to him, and how to encourage him to live in love instead of anger as a way to achieve his dreams and goals. As Christians, we have scripture in which we can turn to that speaks to us about comfort, compassion, of living in love, and how to in interact when we encounter outrage. In this letter of James, we, the church, are given a multitude of examples about how we should be living out our faith in Christ. Because we are the fruit of the word that gives life to an angry, outraged world. Through all the examples that this morning's scripture gives us, I was most touched by the phrase, so always let God's word become like poetry written and fulfilled by your life. 
we are to become the poet, the doer of the word. So what does poetry do? How does it affect? To my understanding, poetry is a style of literature that in its brevity touches at the deepest level of the heart. It brings beauty, invokes reflection and meditation. It activates the emotion that lay deep within us. It is written in a way as to bring us out of ourselves. Now, to be quite frank, poetry doesn't affect me that way. But I know a lot of people who are affected in that manner when they read poetry. But I will tell you what does move me in that same way, and that's music. There are times when I have heard that poetic exercise deep within me as I listen to notes perfectly threaded together to make a melody that causes me to go into meditation, deep reflection, feel the beauty. This letter from James, written sometime between 70 and 80 CE, is written to a church movement that would have been only about 40 years old at the time, providing advice that still holds true to the Christian church today. This letter of James focuses around our conduct with others. James tells us to be slow to speak and quick to listen. You know, one of the primary issues in most church disputes centers around this principle. Many a church dispute comes when people feel that they are not being heard. Whatever the conversation is about, we all need to make sure that we are truly listening to one another. Listening comes only when we open our mind enough to truly hear what is being said. Too often, we're busy thinking of responses instead of stepping back and taking time to hear what the other person is trying to communicate to us. Over these next five weeks, we will be taking a closer look at James' advice to the church as to how to live out our life in the world that is quick to feed on the darkness of negative energy. We will be examining how our faith translates through our actions of how we become poets.